Hi, and welcome to Creating Unique and Compelling Composites in Adobe Photoshop. My name is Julianne Cost, and I'm the Digital Imaging Evangelist at Adobe. So in this session, we're going to walk through the two images that you can see on the screen. For the image on the left, I'll speak more generally about how I built the composite, my sources of inspiration, some basic principles of design, and what techniques we can use to unify individual elements in order to create a more believable image. Then for the image on the right, we're going to move to Photoshop, where we'll actually walk through the creation of the image step by step. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to get started. And don't worry, the session is being recorded. So if you miss something, you can watch it again at any time. Now, this first image was a self-assignment, and the initial concept was based on a book that I'd recently read called West with Giraffes. So I read a lot. I find that I get more interesting images or ideas for images by reading than I do when I'm, say, watching a movie or watching TV. And I think that's because the written word encourages me to use my imagination in order to visualize the story and the characters and the location. So as I read, I make notes of anything that creates a strong visual in my mind, and I write it down so that I have an, an idea book, basically, that I can pull from. So I try to begin my composites with a concept or an idea, but not all of you will, and that's fine. For me personally, a concept or an idea serves as like a map. It kind of gives me a direction. It helps lead me maybe where I want to go. Of course, I can always change directions. I can always take detours as the idea develops, but at least I've got a starting place. Now, just like a movie has a set and a theater has a stage, I start by creating an environment to place my subjects. So part of the storyline in the book is that a pair of giraffes survive a hurricane while they're crossing an ocean. So I started with just some water in the foreground. Then I added some clouds and I just used a layer mask in Photoshop to slowly blend from the clouds into the ocean. Now, while I'm trying out and when I'm beginning to set up the environment, I like to try several different options. And in fact, when I'm out photographing, I'm always looking for clouds and other elements for kind of a, an image bank that I create. And, and I actually have like hundreds of clouds and, and landscapes and textures. In fact, I included some images in a library that you can download using the link on this session page. Now to blend different clouds together, I'll often change the blend mode, I'll change the opacity. And in this case, this ended up being my favorite. So next, I wanted to create more of a horizon. So I went looking for some images of some low mountains. And I liked the way these define the horizon, but it's, it's too dark and moody. So I just lowered the opacity of the layer and I was very happy with the result. So now it's time to start adding my primary subject. So I started with a bottle and I just masked it at the bottom so that it looks like it's floating in the water. But you'll notice that the bottle is quite blurry when compared to the water. But that's okay for right now, because I'm just in this conceptual stage. I'm not even sure if I want to use the bottle. And I find it really easy in Photoshop to get bogged down in the details. And then I realize that I've wasted a lot of time working on an element, like maybe making a mask or something, and I don't even end up using it in the composite. Okay, next I wanted to add one of the giraffes from the story. Now in the book, the giraffes are put in crates on a ship, but we don't have to be that literal with our interpretation, right? So instead of a crate, I decided I would put the giraffe in a bottle, hoping that the viewer would then see it as a metaphor, right? So the giraffe essentially becomes a message in the bottle. And again, I am just working through the composition right now, so I'm not worried about colors or tonality. At this point, I can always refine that later. So once I'm happy with this, it's time to add the secondary subject, which was an owl. So just by placing the owl in the image, the viewer is going to assume that there's a relationship between the two subjects. So hopefully the viewer will ask themselves, you know, what is that relationship? Because I think that if you create an image that asks questions, it can be more engaging. And I personally like it when an image leaves a little bit of room for interpretation. Now, depending on the culture, owls can represent um, magic, uh, wisdom, transformation, which I believe was another point that the author was trying to make. 
that the world maybe is in, in need of a little bit of a transformation, but um, that might just be my interpretation. So you will have to read the book to find out. So at this point, I have the basic composition. I just need to start making sure that the elements do look realistic. Now, not necessarily photorealistic, right? I mean, it is a giraffe in a bottle, but realistic enough so that the viewer can temporarily suspend their disbelief and enter into the image. So I needed to start by re-photographing the bottle. So I did that, and then once I replaced it, I did, uh, it looks like it could be in the ocean, but I did realize that there's a bit of a color highlight on the side of it, which isn't really represented in the scene. So to make it work, I either needed to remove that or add some warmth near the horizon on the right side of the image. It's really subtle, All right, I'll just go back at a slide and then show it again. So see it build on that right-hand side. Oh, and also I forgot to mention, and, and maybe this is um, stating the obvious, so sorry if it is, but to make an image a composite more convincing, it really helps if all the perspective of the elements um, are correct, or if at least fairly convincing. So in this case, the giraffe was photographed from above. I was standing on a platform looking down at it. So it works perfectly because I'm looking down at the water and the owl was photographed from below. So I was looking up at it and this allows me to, to place it higher in the sky because we can see the underside of the wing. But the owl is further away and it should have a little bit less visual weight than the giraffe. So I did decrease the opacity as well as the contrast and the saturation, all right? And so now it's a little bit less um, dominant. So again, that was before and that's after. Now, since the light is coming from the lower right there, that would be behind the bottle. So the bottle does need to cast a shadow. So I did add that, just very slight, just right there. You can see that build in front of the bottle. Um, the water has enough motion in it, I think, that it, it doesn't really need a reflection. But I did feel that the warm tones of the giraffe were a bit out of place, so I did desaturate them. And by removing those warm colors, I think I made the giraffe appear a little bit less healthy and maybe um, perhaps in a bit more distress, which was the intent. Okay, now because all of these elements were photographed under different lighting conditions, they have varying amounts of noise in them. So I knew that I would have to add a texture to even out the noise. So I added this texture, this image of the drops of water, um, but they seem to add like a barrier between the viewer, me, and the subject. So I didn't really care for that. And I'm a firm believer that if if an element isn't adding something to the image, then it's probably taking away from the message that you're trying to convey. So I just removed it. And instead, I just added another really fine grain texture. It was just a photograph of a piece of construction paper. And I think it really ties the elements together. So then another way to unify an image is by remapping all of the colors to a specific color palette. Now you can do this a variety of different ways. You can use a color lookup table, you can use a gradient map, adjustment layer in Photoshop. It can be really helpful when you have really uh, different images, especially if they have really different shadows, like different color casts, like their white balances are different or they've got um, warm shadows and, and, and cool shadows. In this case, in this image, um, they're all pretty unified already, but I did make a gradient map and I applied it on top just to show you. This is a gradient map, it's very simple. It goes from black to white with a little bit of sepia in the mid-tones, but it's far too heavy for this image in my opinion. So to be honest, I just, I wanted to remove it so it's a gradient map adjustment layer. So it automatically has a layer mask. So you can just fill that mask with black and that will hide it. And that allowed me then to go in and paint with a large brush selectively to reveal it in certain areas, which I like because now I've got a little bit of color contrast, the warm versus the cool in the clouds in the mid-tone areas. So now the water started to bug me because it just seemed like it was a little bit too calm. So I tried out some different water. I tried this one. I thought, oh, maybe some with rain in it would be good, but I thought it was too distracting. So I ended up with this one, which I really like. I think the added contrast and the waves just make it a little bit more dynamic. So I guess my point is don't be afraid to let your your image evolve, right? You can always choose save as and go in a different different direction. I also try not to stop at my first solution. So if I think that I've solved it and I'm at a happy place right here, I always wanna take it just a little bit further. So I added a train, which was another element from the book, but now the balance and the composition's off. So I flipped the bottle. Now though, it appears like the bottle is fighting against the waves instead of being swept along with it. And, and then the owl would need to be moved and the train, the train just doesn't really add anything to the image. So I also experienced with other things that I won't even bother to show you, but I added like a, um, 
what's it called? A ringmaster from the circus, um, onions, another figure, uh, gold coins, because those were all meaningful visuals that I got from the book, but they were also all very distracting. So in the end, I really only changed the foreground waves. The other elements just felt like they were um, like very cluttered, right? And in my work, I definitely try to remove everything that isn't there for a reason, like I think I mentioned, because if it's not there, if there's no reason for it, then it's, it's usually trying to, it, it usually will end up taking away from the message that you're trying to communicate. Okay, onwards to the second image. So this one that was also a self-assignment, it's called Everything is Fine. Um, it was inspired not by something I read, but by a dream I had. So I often dream uh, of flying. And we can see that I've constructed a stage. So I've got the water, the basalt columns, and the clouds in the background. I've got my primary subject, which is the figure in the foreground. And then my secondary subject, they're really small, but they're all those little birds in the background, which might be difficult to see over the video. So sorry about that. But the birds also work for me because they're a repetitive element. And they contrast the primary subject in that they're all flying and the primary subject is not, which I'm hoping gives a feeling of kind of loneliness, maybe, um, you know, feeling alone among others, even though, you know, you're surrounded by other people. Um, the mask, very symbolic, uh, as we've all literally been wearing masks. Um, it's also the lightest area in the image. So your eye is going to go there first. And then typically our eye will follow the sight line of a person in an image. So that takes us kind of across the image to the basalt columns. And from there, we kind of go down maybe to the water and then back over to the left with that strong horizontal line. And then maybe up um, through that red kind of uh, wet area, full circle back to the figure. So this is actually the one that we're going to create. So I'm just going to escape out of here and we're going to go over to Photoshop. So excellent. So because I'm the photographer and I took all these photos, except for the one figure of me, um, I and I shoot raw files, I took the liberty of already bringing all of the original elements into a single document so we wouldn't have to spend time doing that. They are all raw files placed as smart objects. And the benefit there is that I can resize them as many times as I want. I can also change their color and tone, reduce saturation, do all sorts of things to them. And I'm always working with the highest possible quality image. So in this image, we can just see here, I'm starting with this base layer, just some clouds. I've got these basalt columns. The problem is, is that there's there's more dirt behind the basalt columns above this. So you can't, um, you can't get a sky, right? There's no way to photograph it that way. So what I need to do is I need to kind of cut through them and, and separate it so there is some sky. Now, when I started doing this, of course, I didn't even know if I was going to use these columns, kind of very similar to like the bottle in the uh, in the last image that we looked at. So I don't wanna waste a lot of time if I don't even know if I'm gonna use this image or not, selecting the exact you know basalt columns, which ones I'm gonna use and which ones I'm not. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go very quickly so that I don't waste a bunch of time here. Oopsie, that was kind of a crazy little selection, but I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna select all this and then I just need to select this bottom part too. So I'm gonna hold down the shift key. We'll come around all the way around here and that should select it. Okay, because I don't want to waste a bunch of time if I'm not even going to use this layer. So then on my layers panel, I would click on the mask icon and that would add my mask. And now we can see that I've got space to put a figure and it looks like I've got sky behind these columns. So the next layer that I want to add is this one right here because I want to add the water, but you'll notice the water line isn't straight and it's not wide enough. So we need to transform this. So I'll use free transform. We can use command or control T. And then I'm going to zoom out a bit because I know I'm going to hold down the Option key on Mac, the Alt key on Windows, and just enlarge this a little bit. And I'll put it right up near the top for the time being because I just want to use this as a reference so I get a straighter waterline. Now, I can never remember like the keyboard shortcuts for skew and perspective and distort. So just right click and you can grab any of those different options. So I'm going to choose distort and then I'm just going to distort this down so that that waterline is straighter. Okay, let's go ahead and apply that. And now I just need to reposition this. And I'm just gonna tap V, that gives me the move tool, and then I can move this down. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little so we can see it a little better. Now this waterline, you know, it can't be down here in the sand, it's gotta be above that. So I'll just place it somewhere, maybe like there, and bring it over, all right? And then we'll add our mask using the mask icon at the bottom of the layers panel. I'll tap G to select my gradient, and let's tap D to get my default colors. Okay, so my gradient, let's reset this. 
my gradient is going from white to black. So white is going to show, black is going to hide. Well, I wanna hide this area up here. So I'll start with white and then just drag up. And if you ever do it the wrong way, you can just use Command I to invert the mask or you can just redraw the mask. In fact, you can even go in here and well, we know that if I switch to the move tool, I can reposition this, right? I can move it, but I can also separate the image from the mask. So if I have the image targeted and I'll just use my arrow keys, you can see that I can reposition the image, all right, without moving the mask, or I can go over to the mask and I can move the mask without repositioning the photograph. All right, so when I'm done, I'll just link those back up. And now, now that I have an idea of like how high I need to place the figure, I think I want to put the figure's feet right about here. Now I know that I need to have a perspective where basically the camera angle is about at the foot level of the figure. So I didn't have any images in my image bank that could do that, so I knew I'd need to take the photograph. So one thing, if you're going to take your own photograph, one thing to look at is the direction of light and the quality of the light, right? So I would much rather work with a flat scene than a scene that has a lot of high contrast in it. So this scene is perfect because my environment has a very lovely quality of light in that it's very soft. I like that, I don't like a lot of contrast. And the direction of light, while it is coming from the right to the left, and I know that because this side of the basalt columns are lighter than the left side. Um, so I knew that when I photographed the figure, I just had to wait for a foggy day. And I had to make sure that I was standing high enough so that I was at the, the my feet were at the level of the camera. So this is the figure. And all I need to do is select it, is choose select and select subject, and it will go ahead and select that. Now, let's zoom in. I'm gonna grab my lasso tool, hold down the option key, and I'm just going to remove this area from the selection, and I'm gonna add, looks like it cut off my little toes there. Oops, that's a little bit too much. So maybe I should take that out. Okay, enough with that. Let's move up to the top. I don't need my head for this image, so we'll just, again, holding down the option key, I'll just take that off. All right, now I need to add the mask. So let's do that on the mask panel. Command zero zooms us out. And then we use the move tool and we just scoot that over. Boom, right there, terrific. Now I need to add the wings. So let's grab this layer and I could use select subject again, but let's take a look at object select, the object selection tool. It's got this cool new feature, the object finder, and it's actually analyzing the image right now so that when I position my cursor on top of an object, it will tell me, oh, I can select that for you. You just click and it selects it. Really cool. So the only thing is when I zoom into 100% and we actually look over here, it didn't quite select enough of this blue. So that's the great thing about Photoshop. There's like a million different tools you can use to select things. I'm gonna go and use one of like the, the first selection tools in Photoshop, the magic wand, hold down the option key and just tell it to remove the blue from around this bird's wing. And it does that. Now let's zoom out a little bit because I don't need the whole bird, right? So I'm gonna grab the lasso and I don't need any of this, right? I don't need any of that area. I don't need the legs, whoops, I don't need that either. I don't need the head. So we can just take that off. Looks like I've got one little pixel there. Okay, and then I might need this. So let's just come across there and add that. Okay, terrific. Now I can go and add my mask. I'm gonna reposition it so that it's below the figure so that that way when I use the move tool and we move this, it's behind the figure. Just zoom out a little bit and then free transform it. So I've got the wing here. I don't like the fact that this side of the wing is larger, um, but that's just because I was shooting up the bird at an angle. So how would I fix that? Well, I can't go into um, the warp tool right now because they're not allowed for linked layer masks with smart objects. So I'll go ahead and apply the transformation that I've already done. But then to get over that little um, hurdle, I'm just going to right click and convert it to a smart object, right? So now Photoshop is looking at the smart object and the mask as one thing. So when I go into free transform, it's not a problem. I can go right here to warp. We can set our grid to five by five. I can hold down the shift key and select a number of different points. I could make this larger or smaller. I can reposition it. I am gonna make it smaller. I could rotate it if I need to. And then let's just scoot that over. That's a little bit too small in comparison to the other one. Okay, that's fine for now. Tap enter return to apply that. Okay, great. So I've got my wing. I need the mask now. So I'll return to the object selection tool and you can still use it the way you know you used to, just drag a rectangle around an object and it'll kind of like 
shrink wrap it to that object. So let's add our mask. Let's get our move tool and let's reposition that. Now, one thing I am noticing now that the wings, oh, do you see this? Look at, okay, so now that the wings, let's hide the mask for a minute. Now that the wings are behind the, the figure, I'm getting a little bit of a halo here. And also, if we hide the mask for a minute, you can see, let's just shift click on that. You can see that it's selecting just this little bit of dark area in the wood slats there, and I don't want that. So what can I do? Well, it's really easy to fix. I've got the mask targeted. I go to the select menu and I choose select and mask. And then in select and mask, let's just view this on black and white. Because what I can do is, well, first of all, I can smooth it. And that's going to, when I add the smoothness slider, that's gonna smooth out those little extra areas that were selected. But then also I can add a feather. So what a feather does is it gives me various levels of gray between what's black and what's white. So what's selected and what's not. And then I can use shift edge in order to push the edge in or pull the edge out, basically choke or spread the mask. So let's view this again on layers, right? Cause that's gonna help us see it. I don't need this big of a feather, maybe one pixel, but probably not even that, maybe 0.7. And then watch as I shift the edge to the right, we see the halo, move it to the left, halo's gone. I click okay, we have taken care of that issue. All right, let's view our mask. That's kind of weird that it's a mask. I mean the figure there with the mask. And let's bring it down, whoops, let's select the right layer, mask layer, and let's reposition that. Now I'm going to transform it <clears throat> and we can use the reference point right here and pin something down. So if we know that the shoulder matches and we can also change the opacity when we're in here so that as we rotate it, it's going to rotate around the pin, that shoulder. All right, and I might just also move it down a little bit. Okay, that looks like it's gonna match. That is good for now. I could be fussy, but I won't be. So we'll transform that. And then I'll bring the opacity back up to 100% here. And then I just need to use a brush. So I'll be sure that I've got the mask targeted. And um, I'm going to come around here. And let's see if, whoops, painting with the wrong color. Let's paint with black. Okay, so I didn't quite line it up there. That's all right. We're going to do this real quick because I can see that I don't have much time left. I have a lot of things that I still want to get to. So let's get a little bit bigger of a brush. And quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, um, besides the problem here with the mask, let's, um, I'm gonna tap the V key and I'm just gonna use my arrow keys. I'm gonna nudge it down and I just need to transform it a little bit. Sorry about that. I just got a little ahead of myself and I wanted to make it. All right, how's that? I like that. What do we say? I say we go with that. I'll tap enter return to apply that. I can't help it. I have to just fix this one little area right here. I'm just going to, oh, goodness gracious. All right. How boring to watch me fix that. Stop it, Julianne. Okay. So what I don't like is the blue color now of this, this um, suit. So I'm just going to double click on the figure layer. That's going to open the raw file in camera raw, where I can go ahead and desaturate it again, using all of the original information. So that's good. So now those blend a little bit better, but I probably need a drop shadow. So I should add a little layer here. I'm just going to call this shadow and let's grab a brush and get a little bit bigger brush. I am painting with black. Oh dear. I'm just going to paint a shadow right like that. You're thinking, oh my goodness, it goes beyond the figure. That's okay because I can go to the layer menu, go to create clipping mask, and now it'll only appear where the figure is. Of course, that's too strong. So I'll tap B to get the move tool what we say 30, maybe 40%. It should probably be a little blurrier, but I'm going to go with it for now because I have lots of other things to show you. So the next thing is the secondary element, right? Those secondary subjects, we need to add the birds. So let's change the blend mode to multiply so they're darker and we'll reposition them so they're underneath the basalt column so they don't show. And then we just need to move them in the image area. All right, terrific. We also need to add a texture to unify because again, we've got elements taken at different times with different amount of noise. So I'll just change this blend mode to overlay. When I do that, the mask gets really, really too bright. So again, double click on it to edit the contents. It's great because all non-destructive. I wanna take my whites down. I also wanna take my highlights down. I'm also gonna use the new masking tools. I'll select the brush. Why? Because when we took the color out of the suit, it also took the color out of my feet. So I want to take the color out of the skin tone here, out of the hair. I'll just use desaturation here, not all the way, but maybe there. Click OK and let's see. 
All right, that's looking much better. Now, remember, at this point, I'd be like, okay, I've got my composition. I actually do know that I wanna use those basalt columns. So I would go back in and recreate the selection. And I would do that by just deleting this layer mask, all right, on the basalt columns. And then I would go in with the pen tool and I would actually create a path going across the exact columns that I wanted to use. Now, nothing is more boring than watching me make a path. So I already made one and I saved it in the file under the paths area. So here's my basalt columns that I want to use. With that path selected and with that layer targeted in the layers panel, I can come here under layer, choose vector mask, and then current path. And so now I've got this nice vector mask. Now, if I zoom in 100% and I hide the edge there, we can see it's, it's like I cut it with some scissors and we don't want that. So I am going to go to my properties panel and with the mask targeted here, I can just increase the feather amount just a little bit just to soften that edge. Okay, terrific. Command zero to zoom out. All right, then there was that kind of wet stain. So actually I'm gonna zoom back into the feet a little bit here and let's go to the top of the layer stack and I'm gonna get the lasso tool. Now, I had some other basalt columns that were wet so I could kind of study how the water would flow. And so what I did is I just went down with the lasso tool and also with the paintbrush. And I just thought, all right, well, let's just create some, some areas here where the water might be dripping down and then maybe it doesn't drip over here and then maybe it comes down here and maybe finds its way like a little crevasse right there and then comes down and up. Now, I probably spent um, probably a half an hour drawing this. So again, uh, too much, too long for, for this session, but basically, and, and you guys probably already know this, but if you spend a long time creating a selection, you can save that selection so you can use it later. So if I go to the select menu, I could just say save selection, which is what I already did. So just like Julia Child, I have something already baked in the oven, only in this case, it's I have a channel already in the channels panel and it's called wet rocks. So when I deselect this, selection right there, we'll see these are the wet wet rocks. And that's the selection that I want to use. So I can just hold down the command key on Mac, control key on Windows, and click on the thumbnail for that channel, and it will load it for me. Okay. So now all I need to do is add a curves adjustment layer. Bottom of the layers panel, I will add curves, and I'm going to bring the curve really far down. Now look, they're starting to look wet. I probably don't want anything really bright, so I'll bring that down as well. And then we can just go to the RGB, the individual red, green, and blue channels. And if I want to add some red, I can just drag this up a little bit. Okay, um, it looks like I don't ha quite have me, the figure in the right place. So I'm gonna target it, use the move tool and just boop, move that down a little. Okay, great, command zero. How is it down here? It looks good. All right, one last thing I wanna do, cause I think I have one minute left. I'm going to zoom into 100%. And I'm just going to move over here. We're going to option click on the feathers. I'm going to grab my marquee tool and I'm just going to drag a marquee around these feathers. And I'm going to use command J as soon as I target that layer, command J is going to make a copy of those feathers. All right. And then I'm going to, again, right click and then show hide all the other layers so we can see it. Now I can't see the feathers, so I'm gonna move them up in the layer stack so they're in between the shadow and the figure. And now I can go ahead and reposition them. But I'm actually gonna hide them for a second because I want to see just this little V here in the suit. And I'll grab the lasso tool and I'll just hold down the option key and that'll allow me to draw straight lines so that I make my selection. Then I can show the feathers layer again and then just add a mask to it then I'll separate by unlinking those two so that I can use the move tool and I can reposition just those little feathers without moving the mask. So when I zoom out, command zero, I know it's a really small detail, but I really like it. I think it adds something. It, might, it kind of makes you think like, oh, the, maybe that really is, wait, wait, are there really feathers? Like, what is that? So I like that, um, I like that a lot. Okay, at this point I probably could add uh, maybe, yeah, I could probably add a, uh, um, a gradient, um, a gradient map layer, but honestly, I don't really think it's going to add anything to it. I think the colors in this image really look good. So maybe I'll just tap F once, F twice. That'll go to full screen mode. And I do know that we are out of time. So I just want to thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope that you learned something. I hope this was interesting. And I really hope that you enjoy Adobe Max. Be sure if you want more information to check out my blog at jcost.com.
Thanks a million. Take care.